It's a pleasure to really welcome and introduce uh, Mr. Ravi Saligram, President and Chief Executive Officer of uh, Newell. Uh, he has been not only president of the corporation, but a member of its board of directors, Newell Brands, which is a leading consumer products company that lives with us daily. Most of us use, use in one fashion or another many of its products on a daily basis. He joined Newell Brands in October of 2019. He's now in his, uh, in his uh, I guess, first year. First year, you're in, you've been there a little more than, than 12 months. And you, your, your task was to really reestablish the organization as the leading consumer products company at the forefront of uh, responding to the challenges of the industry and quite a few challenges in COVID times, I'm sure. He's a visionary leader, no doubt about it. He has a long and distinguished career as a, uh, as a, a multinational uh, executive uh, manager. He was CEO of Ritchie Brothers RBA, the world's largest on-site heavy equipment auctioneers. So he also had experience in the B2B sector, I take it transforming a six decade old organization into a relationship based modern technology driven data driven multi channel company uh, he was also and many of us know him in that capacity uh, the former ceo of office max uh, effective affecting actually and completing the historic merger between office max and office depot in 2013 and had a long previous career uh, as in senior management with Aramark, Intercontinental Hotels Group, and S.C. Johnson. He is an MBA graduate from the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor and a, an engineering grad from Bangalore University, India. He's a distinguished executive, he's an exemplar. Many of our students will learn from him just by watching his trajectory and the decisions he makes as he copes with managing a large operation across countries in turbulent times. So it is my pleasure to, in, to uh, turn, turn the floor over to, to him, to Ravi Saligram. The floor is yours. John, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm uh, really uh, delighted to be here. Uh, thank you for inviting me to the USA, India, and uh, Georgia Tech Business Forum. Uh, real pleasure to be here, and I understand there's a lot of uh, uh, MBA grads uh, and business grads uh, in the audience. So I thought I'd start with sort of a little story. Uh, recently, I was being interviewed, and uh, uh, the interviewer asked me, she said, uh, uh, Ravi, you've been a three-time CEO and uh, what's the secret of your success? And uh, so I sort of uh, um, pondered that a bit and I said, uh, smart people. And uh, she looked at me quizzically and said, what do you mean? So I said, look, when I was very young, my greatest strength was recognizing my weaknesses. And I recognized that God gave me a lot of EQ, but probably not as much IQ. So my best friend, uh, became Basker, and Basker uh, and I, and that friendship has spanned 55 years. He lives in Atlanta. Basker was so brainy, it was, he was brilliant. And I just kept hoping osmosis would drive some of those gray cell server. And uh, Basker came 29th in uh, the SSLC, the high school exam, his name was, the photograph was in the paper, and my uncle was my tutor, I was one year junior to him, said, hey, you gotta get your name in the paper. And I said, yes, sir. And of course, results come out. We all look at the newspaper. Saligram's face is not uh, in the newspaper. And uh, uncle didn't talk to me for six months, believe it or not. But then my quest, I still believed in this formula. So I end up marrying uh, Nalini, my wife. And uh, uh, so she uh, was first in India from nursery to PhD, number one science talent scholar in all of India and all of that good stuff. Uh, so PhD. And uh, so of course that really uh, changed my trajectory because she decided her mission in life was to really 
teach me humility. And she said, I'll do this in many ways. So we have two daughters, so the light of my life. And my daughter's sole mission in life seems to be, let us teach dad humility. And uh, uh, seriously, uh, they're the light of my life. And uh, there's a lot of reverse mentoring and I learn a lot from them. But that is, uh, you, know, you just surround yourself with smart people and you keep hoping uh, with 40 years, I hope you know, that a little bit of that gray matter seeps in. Well, whether it has or not, we don't know, but uh, Jenny has certainly been enjoyable. So for all your business students, you know, make friends with smart people, surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. Uh, and for all the people who may be a little kind of closer to my age, as you know, from India, there's this whole thing, respect your elders. Well, my adage is a little different. Uh, respect the younger ones and listen to them because in today's changing world, uh, that's how I keep up with social media and understand all the changes that have occurred and keeps me young and energetic. So uh, think about reverse mentoring. So with that, let me get started and uh, uh, let, uh, you might have known our company as um, uh, Mule Rubbermaid. And uh, uh, so New Rubbermaid uh, was this company that uh, uh, made a lot of different products. And New Rubbermaid was five, six billion. And uh, thank you. Uh, New Rubbermaid bought a company called Jardin. And Jardin was a very large consumer conglomerate. So this happened in 2016. And the idea was to create this consumer products behemoth. And uh, uh, some things didn't go quite well with that uh, whole acquisition. So, um, and I'll talk about that momentarily, but let's tell you about the new look today. Um, about $9 billion in sales, 30,000 employees, 25 brands. We actually have 100 brands, but 25 brands account for about 85% uh, of sales. 90% uh, of US households buy our brands. I think John mentioned, I hope some of our brands are in your households. And the interesting thing for those of you who are of a technology bent and uh, are following e-commerce trends, uh, we rank fairly high in consumer products and 21% uh, of uh, our first half of 20 sales, global sales, was via e-commerce, was online. So whether it's through walmart.com or Amazon um, or direct to consumer. And we're a relatively global company. A uh, third of our company is uh, uh, international outside of uh, the US. And 10 countries account for 90% uh, of uh, uh, those uh, 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 sales. So a lot of depth uh, in the countries we are. So Canada, Australia, uh, UK, France, um, and big in Latin America. So next slide. Um, you will probably be familiar with these brands. Uh, so uh, really we sort of chase the consumer life cycle. Um, uh, we don't do cradle to grave, we've not done the grave bit, but definitely cradle on to youth and to uh, adulthood. Uh, so we start with baby with uh, Graco uh, strollers and car seats. Uh, we have uh, Rubbermaid uh, containers, Nook pacifiers, a crock pot, the original slow cooking. Uh, so great for making dolls, by the way. When I first came to the country, I learned to make dal in a crock pot, so try it sometime. Um, Mr. Coffee, uh, ubiquitous coffee maker. And of course, uh, Sharpie pens, everyone knows Sharpie. Even our president uses it. Um, and uh, uh, Elmer's glue, uh, Yankee candle. So you name it, we have it. In, in very different ones. And for those of you uh, who are pen lovers, uh, not only do we have Sharpie, but also Parker and Waterman. And uh, so uh, um, that, those are the set of brands we have. Next. So let me just step back a bit in time and give you a little background. So Newell is a smaller company and really is doing well and goes and buys uh, Jardin. Jardin's a huge company, about 11 billion or so sales. It's a 16, 17 billion dollar acquisition, very big. And uh, um, so it's bringing a lot of consumer brands together in different categories. 
Um, unfortunately, yeah, this is a great lesson, especially for you MBAs. Uh, you can do all the great financial due diligence and the operational due diligence, but what is seldom paid attention to is culture. And, and people don't think about, hey, do the cultures match? match? And the interesting thing was Newell uh, and my predecessor had done a very good job. He had centralized a lot of things, taken out costs, but Jardin was a very uh, diversified and decentralized company. And each business unit was a pretty much a separate company with CEOs, et cetera. And when we tried to, when the company tried to put it together in 16, a lot of clashes because Newell tried to put the central model onto Jardin, didn't work. There's a lot of issues. Activists came in, the thesis didn't work out, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, suffice to say, as we approached uh, 2017 and 18, uh, sales started uh, declining and uh, there was a lot of debt that had been taken to uh, buy this company. And so the balance sheet was not in the best of shapes. And so the, there's a myriad of issues. And so today when I joined, uh, there were really five big issues we faced. Uh, declining sales, and in a consumer packaged goods company, uh, sales growth, uh, even if it's modest, is very important. Company was very complex. Um, we had 49 ERP systems, 1,000 legal entities, uh, uh, more than 110 warehouses and uh, manufacturing plants, um, uh, 400 websites. So you name, and about 110,000 SKUs just uh, more than, uh, uh, I think it was a lot more than P&G. So a lot of complexity and our cash conversion cycle was not so great. So a lot of issues. Our overheads were bloated. So, and because the model, the organizational structure uh, hovering between centralized and decentralized and one of the issues was the company was into sort of, had a tough time with gray. It could either do, okay, totally centralized or totally decentralized, but in between was tough. And so that's what I mean by structure as well. And culture, because of all these issues with an integration that went wrong, uh, the culture was really, people were in doldrums, there was an internal focus. And uh, uh, so that created, uh, morale was low, engagement was low, and there was a lot of restructuring because they had to reduce the overheads and so on. So we had a lot of issues. Uh, the good news is uh, uh, just prior to my joining, uh, he came about six months before I did. Chris Peterson, our CFO, is terrific. He started initiating a turnaround and then I joined October. Uh, so it's been about a year and 20 days. That's a lot of years in uh, CEO time. We look at it in dodges. So, uh, uh, but we've uh, uh, built on the turnaround and it's taking hold. And then we think that 2021 20, and beyond will start getting to our potential. So let me go into the next slide, please, to give you a little bit of uh, the journey. But when we talked about this turnaround plan to investors, we also said, look, there is a bright future. And we laid out some aspirational targets. We said, hey, our core sales, our organic sales um, uh, will be low single digits in a long-term basis. We'll increase operating margin every year in 50 bips. Our free cash flow productivity, which is how do you drive cash versus your net income, will be greater than 100%. And we'll bring down the debt to uh, uh, aspirationally to three. And we've been steadily on that journey. So we got this turnaround going. We presented this very prestigious conference, Cagney, uh, this year in February. And things were really going well. Next slide, please. Uh, when, of course, COVID hit. Um, next slide, yeah. Uh, so this was something we had really, none of us had planned on, that there'd be a global pandemic. And so when you're turning around a company, it's difficult enough. Uh, but when you try to do a turnaround in the midst of uh, a, a pandemic, it makes it a bit more difficult. So the issue then was, how do we go about it? Look, when I joined, I established a very clear philosophy because I'd re read all the difficult stories of our employees on Glassdoor and I really felt for them. And I said, hey, we've really got to go. First thing is a people first philosophy. 
and not just in words and not saying, hey, I read that in the one minute manager or something like that, but believe it from your heart and make sure that all your actions really prove that out. And so that really was our North Star, that people first philosophy. And so when COVID hit, our first and first priority was no matter what, it is the safety and well-being of our employees. So we were one of the first to uh, uh, close down our offices and uh, uh, we had to keep the plants running uh, because that was very important. A lot of our products were deemed essential. And, but we made our factories very safe. We, we uh, uh, brought in uh, someone from a former uh, person from the CDC who had, held, had done pandemics to advise us on how do we drive up safety. We started introducing masks before they were fashionable and really pushed that to say, hey, um, let, this is so important. And there was a lot of resistance at first because people don't like wearing masks in the factory and it's not easy. But we made our frontline employees our heroes. And so that helped and to show a lot of compassion and caring that when you wear a mask, you really care for someone else. And then we also went about uh, preserving our financial health and making sure a lot of laser focus on cash flow and getting strong liquidity. So uh, we did a bond offering just to get, uh, we had $2 billion of liquidity at the end of Q2, so very strong on that. So really put the focus starting in about March, it was all about these three things, really laser focus my entire management team. So, but at the same time, in parallel, we were beginning to drive the turnaround agenda forward. First and foremost, I've always believed that the CEO is a mere orchestra conductor. You're only as good as your orchestra. You've got to get fantastic musicians. And so it is all about building a winning team. So set about reshaping our leadership team and really brought in great heavy hitters, A players, the best of breed and uh, with domain expertise in their businesses because when you have a diverse business, what it takes to run a fragrance business, a home fragrance business like Yankee Candle is very different from running a fire alarm business like First Alert and quite different from running a B2B commercial business like Rubbermaid Commercial. Um, so we've gone about that and my leadership team now is pretty much complete with the exception of one role, which is our e-commerce head. Second, we were very focused on how do we restart a growth engine? How do we get growth back? And at the same time, we focused on cash, on productivity, improving productivity in our factories, reducing complexity, uh, making a very, putting operational goals on SKU reduction, and then looking at a zero-based way to trim our overheads and get it to industry benchmarks. Next chart, please. So at the same time, I wanted to articulate a way to all our people, because it's one thing for a leadership team, but the key thing for a leader is how do you bring your organization along, all the way to the factory worker so that they understand where you're trying to go. How do you simplify it and telegraph it in an easy way? And so we did that with what we call five C's. And I guess once an ad man, always an ad man. So this served as a mnemonic device. And so the five C's were all about, hey, the first one was about creating a culture of winning. The second was about being a consumer company, a consumer first mindset, and really looking at consumer trends, which has helped us a lot during COVID. And then third was, it's not enough just to be uh, great on the consumer, but you need to collaborate with your customers. And that, I mean, Walmart, Target, Costco, all of the customers, how do you collaborate with them so that you can actually reach the consumer and they feel you're easy to do business with? And the fourth was about channel management. How do we create an omni-channel focus? And omni-channel is really about in today's world where you have online or buy uh, online and pick up at store uh, or curbside. And uh, uh, there's so many ways rather than saying, because there's historically, there's been a brick and mortar mindset. How do you really create a digital first mindset, but take that even beyond to an omni-channel focus, which is recognizing, hey, 
Let us create amazing brand experiences, no matter where the consumer shops, how they shop, when they shop, let us make sure that the brand is omnipresent present with great experiences, which means you have to do a lot of personalization. You have to really understand e-marketing. You have to understand search. So marketing today is so different from when I was a brand manager at SC Johnson many years ago. So, but this omni-channel, that is the future. So really understanding that the consumer has various ways to shop. You may go to Amazon to uh, understand products or to Google, and then you may go buy in stores. So understanding those patterns and following the journey of the consumer, that is so critical. And the fifth was really all about continuous Im improvement and bringing innovation back. Something you may not know, but uh, in 1994, I'm very proud of this, Rubbermaid, which was a separate company at that time, Rubbermaid was named Fortune's most admired company in America. Number one, yeah, absolutely number one. And it was actually on the top 10 for 10 years before that, it became number one. Why? Because they were known for innovation in a fairly unglamorous business, whether it was uh, containers or refuse cans, they put out an innovation a day. So we're bringing that sort of focus back. In fact, we have a major initiative called 1994, and it's all about bringing innovation back. And then we're saying it's not just innovating on product, but whether it's IoT, whether it's supply chain productivity, drive innovation and leverage disparate technologies. So those were the five C's we went out with in uh, February with, uh, and March with the team. But then with COVID hitting, I wanted to add two C's. And I felt, look, part of our culture really has to be about caring and compassion, that you gotta care for others and uh, really show uh, true compassion. And, uh, and then the next one we added after George Floyd's murder, I was so touched by that. And it really, for me, was a, an awakening that we've got to do things to really work on reducing and eliminating systemic injustice and barriers. The American dream can't be just for a few. The American dream has to be for everybody. Uh, I've been very lucky and in terms of being able to experience the American dream, but it can't be just for a select few. And therefore I think for CEOs, it's very important that we focus on this issue and how do we reduce systemic barriers. And so this call on your conscience was another C we added. Next please. So I talked about creating a winning team. Uh, these are the new people we brought in, um, and they're all terrific. Uh, so uh, several CEOs, a new CHRO, a new chief customer officer, but also, and they're all terrific in their own right, superstars. And then the people that I've not put on the chart but some of the existing people like Chris Peterson, my CFO, uh, Brad Turner, my uh, general counsel, et cetera. So we have an incredible team now. And this team is not political. Uh, they're very good, they're very collaborative. And that's one of the things I emphasize is that you have to be a team player. At the same time, I don't allow what is called as, hey, no jerks, that's my philosophy. No jerks, no AH. And in case people don't know what an AH is, look it up, it's in French. So, uh, but uh, for me, I have a firm belief that good people finish first. You don't have to really be a jerk to win. And so team play. So what we think about our business is, hey, it's like soccer. Uh, it's not like tennis. It's not an individual sport. It's a team sport. Let's move to the next one. So with all of this, we had the team in place. We have a plan in place and COVID hits. So rather than saying, oh my God, the world is coming to an end, we said, let us, with all the things we've built up, let us really go after the consumer trends. We started seeing that there was a real um, uh, 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 focus on cooking and uh, in, uh, people started with, hey, uh, for hygiene reasons, let's just bring takeout or cook at home. Uh, so it began first as hygiene. Then it became a hobby. Now you have the advent of the home chef. So our products, 
whether it's Caltron, whether it's Oster, whether it's Rubbermaid, people are organizing their pantries. So they are taking off like rocket ships. And then we went to Rubbermaid and said, hey, it was very embryonic, but we said, let us get into sanitizer, both in the commercial side, so as well as uh, on the consumer side with tabletops. And with people being cooked up at home, our outdoor products like Coleman Tents were really the perfect thing. So we were driving innovation in there. Coffee consumption is up because people are, were not able to go to their Starbucks. So we started innovating on that front. And our, uh, uh, when you want to take baby out, obviously very important to have your car seats. And then when you want to relax after a very stressful day and uh, Yankee Candle helps you relax. So there are a lot of things that we started leveraging our consumer trends. Next slide, please. So I'll just, yeah, this is an example Rubbermaid. We launched, we knew that uh, glass was an important facet. So we launched Rubbermaid Brilliance Glass and Rubbermaid's been getting uh, a market share. And then we did with this advent of hygiene, we put out something, a Rubbermaid Easy Fine Lid with a antimicrobial uh, protection. Next. So the next one was on our uh, uh, commercial business. So you can see the Rubbermaid stand, it's contactless and you get the sanitation. And this is, uh, yeah, we're scaling this very rapidly from beginning. Uh, this was just done in four or five months. And we think over the next several years, it'll be a hundred million dollar business. Next slide. And we then came out with the right price point on ice coffee maker from Mr. Coffee. And uh, this is, we introduced in Target, it's just selling off the shelf, it's out of stock. Uh, it's been a great, great success, especially going after the millennials. We've also got our Oster Diamond Force appliances with the special coating, uh, a rechargeable portable blender from Oster. So you can see when you get onto the consumer trends and innovate, you get success. Next. This is one of our products, a stroller called Graco Modes Nest. The beauty of this is the uh, stroller piece, you can bring it closer to mom so that when you're going for a walk, there's that human connection so important during COVID. Next. Um, we also came out with people are sitting now in patios. So we put out these uh, beautiful Woodwick outdoor candles and to create some serenity. Next slide. Uh, and then our very important business of writing. This is a significant part of our profits and uh, where we do not only Sharpie uh, uh, markers, but we've introduced the Sharpie S gel. And uh, this is the first time Sharpie came out with a pen, beautiful product. Uh, and from my Office Max days, I used to use a competitor and now once I got the Sharpie S gel, I love this product, it writes so beautifully. And so we've been gaining share, but this has been an issue for us because when people are staying at home when, uh, and not going to the office with all the schools not opening, so our writing business has been hurt, but that's why driving this innovation, this has helped us, but clearly a challenge, but because we've done well on the other businesses, we've been able to offset some of the softness that we've had uh, in writing. Next. So now for all those uh, e-commerce types in the audience, uh, I just thought, I think my friend Ram Prasad's on it and uh, he said, hey, say something about e-commerce. And uh, so we really did, uh, we had all these websites and they were not very good. So we went through a whole replatforming exercise We've converted about 60% of our US websites to a new platform. And uh, we're already seeing, we do more than 100 million sessions per year. And we're building unique, our unique users are going up. And then what we did is as we replatform, we also came up with three types of website, catalog website, a marketing website, and a direct to consumer website. So we're really understanding how to leverage e-commerce so that this becomes a real good, uh, um, uh, strength for us as we go forward. Next, please. And I'll show, this chart shows you 21% of our global sales um, is now uh, done through e-commerce. And just look at that baby chart. About 60% of our sales of baby products 
is actually online, online through Amazon, through walmart.com. Um, so it is just, uh, and what we're trying to do is work the penetration of each of our other businesses. Next, we've also driven operational improvements. I'm not gonna get into that today, but we've done a lot of work in our factories, introduced new programs uh, so that productivity, we've improved our cost of goods so that our gross margins improve. And then we've taken out a lot of complexity. Uh, about 40% of our SKUs now have been reduced. So, and, and we're going through a lot of work on our ERP systems have come down dramatically. We're going with SAP throughout. So a lot of work on reducing complexity as well. So next chart. With all of that, we're seeing very good consumption. So consumption is what's happening at store level uh, or on site level, uh, our point of sales, which is consumption, consumer velocity, whether it's last four weeks, 13 weeks or 26, and this was through uh, second quarter uh, that we just talked about, or, or uh, we talked about this in our Barclays conference in August. So this is sort of August going backwards. Uh, four weeks, 13 weeks, 26 weeks, our consumer consumption was up year to date. Uh, it was up through August. And then we also return to sales growth. This is what we ship to retailers. So uh, we return to sales growth for the last uh, three months through August. So uh, all the fruits of our labors is paying off because we said top line growth is very critical. At the same time, our cash flow is uh, also uh, through August to through second uh, quarter was doing very well. So overall, the turnaround, even with COVID has paid off. And then you might ask, so what about uh, your employees? Even though it's COVID in a perverse way, it has helped really bond our employees. So with that, let me end my presentation and get to some key messages. Next slide, please. So what does this all tell you? Uh, I just picked four things for today's thing. People first, when people believe that you're authentic, genuine, and that it's all about them, not about you, and that leaders really take accountability and, and your job is to show the direction, create an environment, empower people and let people flourish, things happen. So leadership matters. Innovation is key, especially in a consumer business. And innovation is not just about product innovation, it's about everything you do. So you've got to create an innovation culture. And to me, omni-channel is the way forward, really helping how do you address the consumer wherever they shop, when they shop, how they shop, and create amazing brand experiences. So that sort of, uh, hopefully that gives you some sense that even during COVID, even during all the issues this company is, the country has gone through, uh, that you can prevail. And I'm very, very proud of our organization, our leadership team. They're the ones who've made it happen. So with that, John, I'll uh, let you take it away and ask any questions from you or the audience. Thank you very much, Ravi, for a very inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, you have challenged us in many ways. I have a number of uh, questions, if I may. Uh, being a professor of uh, strategy and international management, one that comes to mind, what, what specific challenges of multinational management? You, you're a US company based in, headquartered in Atlanta but you're present, as you said, in at least 10 or more countries. Are there unique characteristics and challenges of managing a multi-country, multi-product operation that you wish to share with us in terms of structure, in terms of uh, leadership, in terms of making sure all teams from different countries are on the same program and share the same values? Great question, John. Uh, so look, I've lived in six countries. I've worked in about 50. In my former career, I've been president of international twice. So that gives me a little bit of a unique vantage point. Uh, what I've concluded through my years is that human beings essentially are the same. 80% is similar, 20% is different. And you've got to figure out what of that 20% do you address? And because sometimes people focus too much on differences versus commonalities and similarities. So the jobs of leaders is to leverage the commonalities and address the differences in an appropriate way. So, um, and I think that is very key. When it comes to uh, consumers, 
understanding those differences and making sure that uh, you are not uh, missing some of the trends. So for instance, one of the things are Oster brand. In Latin America, it's seen as a very premium brand, really high quality. Uh, and it's, it's, whereas in America, it's more a mid-price point brand. So accordingly, it's a different how we position it, how we drive it. Um, the functionality is the same. So I think really understanding that. Second, um, it was very interesting during COVID, um, the similarities of people and their basic needs came to really bear and everyone has the same issues in some ways. So we really, we didn't take a view of this is US, this is, uh, uh, because we started getting concerned about COVID when it hit in China uh, first for our employees. So we started learning and saying, what do we need to do? Which is why we were one of the first to close the offices. We started putting, putting in contingency plans. So making sure that you have a network of information and taking feedback from different parts of the world uh, so a third one would be sometimes trends come from different places. And so for instance, I think Europe, Asia, they like color, fashion, like we sell the Breville brand in the UK, not uh, Breville is not ours globally, but just in the UK. And so we drive, they drive a lot of color. And in the US, people are more into sober colors. So we're trying to see, hey, like you saw in the ice coffee maker, we're trying different colors. So you can learn, I think the mindset, you have to have uh, a global mindset. And so people talk about local, being global in your approach, but making sure you allow for local differences. I still think that matters. And then I'll talk about values. Look, to me, it's very important when you run a global company that you don't sort of pound your chest and say, these are American values and we're great and this and that, because values are universal values of integrity, of kindness, of compassion, of teamwork, all of these are universal values. And one of the things I strive with my team to do is to say every employee, whether they are in India or in China uh, or in Brazil, Mexico or uh, Canada, they should sleep well at night. We never should as a company make them do things that will not give them a good night's sleep. And when people know that, that also acts as a great deterrent uh, to really doing wrong things. So I'm, the emphasis is not just on doing things right, which is important, but also always doing the right thing. That universal values, I think, is a pretty important thing. Now, there are challenges when you have a global network uh, uh, of factories, and uh, so you have different issues uh, so it, it's very important to have great leaders. And so my last comment again would be, when you become a global company, it's, it's not about flags on maps because you can boast and say, oh, we're in 200 countries or 150 countries. So what? It's important to have depth because you need to understand the consumer, the supply chain, all of the things that, so that you can be a leader in that country. And most of our brands, we're number one, number two, and we do that by building depth rather than breadth. I was struck by the notion of reverse mentoring in your early comments, learning from the er younger generations. I think that, that's critical and that's a talent. That's not easy. Uh, one of the reasons why, become a prof why one becomes a professor presumably is to remain a lifetime student, which means learning from your students rather than really teaching them all the time. But in your case, you are really using the, the new generation, the next generations to really guide your consumer choice, to really guide your choices of product lines and to guide your innovation. Can that be said in point of fact? Yeah, I think it is. Um, uh, <clears throat> I think the uh, uh, big enemy there of uh, its ego, you know, we all are trained to think, oh, as you get older, you get wiser. Uh, maybe, but it could also be, you work 40 years, but it's one year repeated 40 times. So uh, unless you have a learning mindset, and today, look, 
Facebook was created by Mark Zuckerberg when he was very young. And uh, uh, Bill Gates was very young when he started Microsoft. So you really got to learn from, because technology, the world is changing so fast. So uh, I talk to our young people. I do listening sessions. I do meet up, employee meetups and really try to learn from them. And social media is a great way because that's where you have a lot of dialogue. And so I, you know, my daughters are great teachers for me. And, but just my employees, uh, I learn so much from them. And the whole thing about, and it can be applied whether it's on business matters, but also on social matters. John, very interesting thing. Uh, Cantor did a study about brands and companies. And um, in the 50s through the 60s, the expectation was that corporations and brands were all about stuff, make great stuff, make great products, stuff that were uh, functional and all of that. And then it started shifting more to, um, in the 70s, 80s, et cetera, uh, a little bit more about uh, uh, CSR, et cetera. And then it became self-actualization. But now it's very interesting, uh, a significant part of our, the consumers today, not just us, but everyone is saying that they expect corporations and brands to take the right stand on social issues. In fact, over two thirds of millennials and Gen Z's have said, hey, brands and corporations, there's a lot of divide in this country. We expect companies to really address these issues and be a force for good. So I think these are, and so young people are driving these. So you can't manage your business the way you do uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, one of my learnings, it's interesting, John, but just little things. Uh, when I was at Ritchie Brothers, one day my daughters came and uh, we were going up the, we're coming down the elevator and some young employees were on the lift and uh, was on the elevator with us. And I just smiled at them, but didn't say anything. And so as I got out, my daughters reproached me and said, dad, you didn't say anything to them. And this was my old thinking because when I joined, we were taught, lose lips, sink ships, don't talk on elevators. They said, no, dad, you're a CEO. Say something to them, ask them about their day, how they are, connect with them. So I think, you know, it is just, as long as you don't have an ego and you are willing to learn from everyone, uh, I think that is uh, where you can be successful. And today I'm so proud, a lot of CEOs are doing this. And I just signed the CEO pledge a few months ago for the action on diversity. And there's so many other CEOs. We, I just saw a lot of companies, we just uh, signed on the Civic Alliance about democracy and they're running ads. So it's, it's just, I think, it is the nature of running a company today. As a CEO, it's quite different from what it was even when I did it first time at Office Max. I noticed you didn't say too much about your competition. And I was curious uh, how you define your competition uh, in the US and globally speaking. Do you think China uh, is, could be a competitor in terms of its uh, new generation of firms? So, yeah, we, um, because we have eight businesses, John, each business has its own set of competitors. So uh, uh, the people we compete with, uh, for instance, in our writing business, uh, it could be Bic from France or it could be yeah. Pilot from Japan. Uh, so they're different. Uh, whereas uh, uh, someone like in the firearm business, it may be like a Kira versus our first alert. So our home fragrance with Yankee Candle, we might uh, compete with a lot of boutique people who sell in a lot of boutique stores. Uh, at the same time, if you look at the thing broader, we might look at, hey, home fragrance, you actually compete with the giants like S.E. Johnson with Glade or with Febreze from P&G. So, so we have more than enough competitors. And on our appliances, there's a whole slew of people, KitchenAid, et cetera. Uh, that we compete with or Ninja. The thing you've got to be careful about is, and what I tell our people is, we cannot have big company thinking. 
you've got to think about today, it's all about disruption. So, and the same I said at Ritchie Brothers, you could either be a disruptor or become the disruptive. So, which is, it's a lot more fun to be a disruptor than being a disruptive, uh, because it's the person who's thinking in their garage and they don't have fetters, they don't, they think differently, they imagine the world differently. So we've got to be constantly disrupting ourselves. Uh, and then to your point about China, we source a lot of product from China. So clearly sometimes the people that we source products from can be, themselves become competitors. So we're always wary of that. Uh, but consumer business, it's really about building brands. So it's, it's uh, uh, so we watch out more from the suppliers. So our issues are more, hey, if, if some of our big retailers, when they put our private label and when they go to China and go to the same person uh, that we're sourcing from uh, and they get the same product, then that's why innovation is key, that you've got to keep it up and drive it. I was going to ask you a question about your experience in mergers and acquisition, and you have had quite a bit of that. What would you say are some of the takeaway and lessons from conducting a merger and acquisition and choosing a target of acquisition? Uh, yeah, so I think I'll give you two very quick uh, uh, answers. Um, uh, one is uh, on, uh, at, obviously here at Newell, uh, we had an integration that didn't really pay that much attention to some of the cultural aspect. And so you've got to really make sure that the thesis is right. And you've always got to watch against uh, big, bigger doesn't mean better. And because a lot of times it's uh, uh, management hubris that uh, uh, drives acquisitions. And so you've got to make sure that the thesis is right. And one of the things that's very important is never fall in love with an acquisition candidate and start thinking emotionally. Whenever my people start recommending, oh, this is very strategic, all the danger signals start. As soon as you say it's strategic, that means the economics will not work out. The economics have to work out. Uh, to me, a beautiful acquisition was for me, for us at Ritchie Brothers, which was a brick and mortar company. We bought Iron Planet, which was our number one competitor, but they were on an online model. And, but we were very successful, we were bigger. The entire organization was really, could not understand why I'd want to buy Iron Planet, which was a distant number two, but they had an online model. More importantly, they had great talent. And when we did it, even though it was 100% acquisition, I treated it as a merger and said, may the best talent win. So we took a lot of the Iron Planet people and promoted them to very high positions. And most of them are still with the company today. And that's, it's very important that you know why you bought the company. And especially if you're going for technology and stuff, make sure you preserve the talent. And, may, and because sometimes ego is like, oh, we know better. So, well, you don't know, if you were that good, then you wouldn't have bought them in the first place. Ravi, I see that we have reached the end of our allotted time, but may I ask you a favor or a question rather? When we go back to more normal times, who knows when, perhaps you can consider a visit to Georgia Tech to address the student body or to address the Scheller College of Business uh, MBAs in person. <laughs> John, it'll be my pleasure and honor. Uh, uh, it's been, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'd be delighted to do that. I love talking to students and uh, learn from them. And uh, so uh, that'll be great. I look forward to it. Keep safe. And to all the audience, keep safe. Do wear masks. It's not a political statement. You're just being compassionate and considerate to others. Onwards and upwards. Thank you very much. We've learned a lot. Appreciate Thank you. you.